Welcome all you sweaty nerds to a very special Collider Heroes. This is the 2015 superhero wrap up where we're going to talk about the films that came out in 2015 and cover them. There's not even half as many as that are coming out in 2016. We had four major releases in 2015. 2016, there's more than eight. It's crazy. But we're going to rock on and talk about 2015. With me, we've got John Campia. Thanks for being on. Last show of the year. Yes, Very sir. excited. I mean, think, think about this. Right behind around this. Could you imagine about five or six years ago that we'd be talking about a movie, that had a year that had four major comic book movies coming out? No. And man, that's not even half of what's coming out next no. year. Like, wrap your head around that for a yeah, second. That's crazy. It's insanity. Robert Meyer Burnett, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me back. Always good to be here with the two Johns. Um, I just can't believe I got to see Ultron on the big screen this year. Right? I love Ultron. <laughs> There's so many firsts. I can't believe that Ant-Man even was a film. So it's like, I was like, never thought I'd ever see yep. Ant-Man as a film. I know. After, you know, the, the Kurt Busiek, uh, George Prez, Avengers, Avengers 22. Mm -hmm. I love that. Although I will say this, I really miss that panel. When Thor beats down the door and says, Ultron, we would have words with thee. <laughs> How could that not be in the movie? I love that. Well, maybe it was. Maybe it's a deleted scene. Could I be. don't know. But, you know, let's kick it off right now with uh, the first film that came out in 2015, Kingsman. Now, this was a Matthew Vaughn uh, film. Uh, it was adapted by Mark, uh, Mark Millar and Dave Gibbons' uh, comic book, Secret Service. And it was called Secret Service while it was in production. And then it changed to Kings, Kingsman, The Secret Service, and just, just Kingsman. Starred Taron Egerton and Colin Firth. Let's talk about uh, what, how amazing this film. I'll start it off. I thought this film was fantastic, and I had no expectations, really, other than, oh, it's going to be you know like an adaptation of the comic. I'd read the comic. It's going to be a fun spy thriller. I'd seen the trailer. The trailer was enticing and looked really well done. I liked Matthew Vaughn's work. I had no idea how much I would enjoy this film and how well executed. And, I mean, really, it's right under, as far as all the spy movies that came out, we had five different spy movies. Yeah. And I think Rogue Nation was the best spy movie to come out way better than Spectre. And then Kingsman was my second spy movie, as well as being a comic book adaptation. It's, it's not less so a superhero film, but it is a comic book adaptation. Robert, let's talk about Kingsman. What do you think? I loved it. And if you would have told me that I would have liked this movie way more than I like Spectre at the beginning of the year, I would have said, you're crazy. I'm a lifelong Bond fan. This movie was, it brought back the flavor. It felt to me like I felt when I was watching Spy Who Loved Me back in 1977 mm. when I was a kid. This movie is so much fun. And what's really interesting is Sam Jackson it has a compelling reason for doing what he... I kind of wanted him to win. Mm. I was like, huh. <laughs> I wanted the bad guy to sort of succeed in his nefarious schemes. I mean, you got to love when uh, any movie has a secret base inside the, the Swiss Alps. You know, and, and I, the training sequence was great. The lead characters were great. I mean, I, I felt this was sort of the attack the block of spy movies. I yeah. mean, I, I really loved it. And, you know, another spy movie I liked, too, along the same lines, was Man From U.N.C.L.E., which gets no love at all. I really, really liked Man From U.N.C.L.E. I, I wish more people had seen it. I thought it was really good. And I thought, like, these two movies together, they're going to be an end, uh, playing on double bills endlessly. Mm -hmm. they, they have that same sense of fun. Uh, this movie was so beautifully made. And you know what it is from the opening credits, those 3D credits that are spinning out from the, the torture room where they're torturing that terrorist. I mean, I, I loved everything about this movie. Yeah, it's great. John, the how about you? Big question, going. I mean, Matthew Vaughn's directing it. Big up, right? Graphic novel's really good. Big up. The big question I had going into it was, Colin Firth, one of the best actors on the planet, if you haven't seen King's Speech... Watch right. King's Speech. He's so good in that. Won the Academy Award for Best Actor for that. Could he be an action star? And I'm like, uh, well, I mean, I'm going to watch it. I'm just a little bit nervous. Like, Hell yes, Colin Firth can be an action star. You're damn right he can be an action star. Because, you know, you figure you got Colin Firth in the movie and you got Mark Strong. You figure Mark Strong's going to do all the action. Mark Strong's the egghead right. in it, which, which who saw, mm -hmm. saw that coming, which is great. So good. And he's like the butler. He's the Alfred. Yeah, you know? and Taron Egerton, this was a revelation. This kid so good. is great, and there's a reason why a lot of Star Wars fans right now have Taron Egerton as their number one choice right now to play the young Han Solo. A lot of people are leaning towards this kid for a good reason. And now we just saw this trailer. This movie was no fluke, because now we just saw a trailer for Eddie the Eagle, and you don't even recognize the kid, and you can already right. tell he kills it. This movie was fun. It was funny. It felt like it had real stakes. The action choreography was, you could tell this was from the same guy who gave us kick ass. Mm -hmm. For just from the action choreography alone, you knew it was the same team. But that's a good thing in this case. 
it all flowed so great. Really funny characters. I mean, a girl with sword legs as the big villainous henchman. I mean, who thinks of this stuff? Well, the graphic writers do. But it just, it worked on just about every level. Ironically, the only thing about this movie, the only thing that didn't work for me, and it's just a small part, was the great Michael Caine and, and his character. That other that character didn't work for me in the movie. Mm. Too easy of a turn and all that kind of stuff. But right. aside from that, I just drooled over this film. Let Loved me, it. Let me mention my, my highlight piece of this film that I could see on loop forever was the scene that Colin Firth, when he went into that church and they were playing Freebird, yep. and everybody what became a homicidal maniacs. There's a device, uh, just as a, as a note, we're gonna talk spoilers for all of these movies. Because so, all these movies have been yeah. out for a long yeah. time. If you haven't seen them, they're all yeah. out on video now. So we're gonna talk, if you don't wanna know any more about Kingsman or the other films from 2015, just watch this next year after you've seen all the films from 2015, because we wanna actually talk about some scenes like this scene in the church when they, he puts his hand down and activates the murder weapons and you know everyone goes crazy and Colin Firth has to just take everyone out in one of the most horrifically violent violent yet satisfying action sequences I've ever seen played to Freebird. I don't think I'll, you know, I can't even hear that song anymore without thinking about the, that scene. So hats off to all of you people who put that scene together and made that happen. It was very satisfying. Like, what, what, any other words about Kingsman? Oh, I love the fact that it <laughs> it ends on a very blue sex joke oh, yes yeah. where where uh the, the princess of norway offers a certain area of her anatomy up for certain grabs orifices for... will be yours if you save the world she <laughs> seems enthusiastic about it. Felt, i'll be honest the joke felt a little out of place well because she it was so but explicit like suddenly like laughed. wow yeah but uh and even the way My she wife said it laughed i mean it was yeah it was uh it was a lot of fun and also you know the talk about colin firth the um the first scene in the bar when they're just sharing oh, the pint. It's so you good. know, and there's another great fight mm -hmm. scene where he he it's just and it's so you know, it's His so much fun. dialogue even sounds like a loser because he's like, So are we going to talk or are we going to fight? Even that he <laughs> right. sounded like a loser, and then he kicks everybody's ass. It was ass. great. I and, and to, again a movie that straddles the line of goofiness and gritty. And it does it in a great, great way. I mean, I, I keep harking back to thinking what if Joel Schumacher had made Batman movies the way they made Kingsman, mm. they would have worked and we would still be talking about them, not how bad those movies would be. But that is a really tough thing to do tonally. And just in case you guys were wondering where Luke Skywalker went, he's in this movie. He's in, yeah, he's Mark a great Hamill sequence. Is in the Mark movie. Hamill, yes. I love his character work, and you won't be disappointed when you see this if you haven't seen it. It's a great little bit with him in the beginning. So Kingsman... What a fantastic way to start off 2015. We just rolled right into our next movie, Avengers Age of Ultron. This is the sequel to The Avengers, the movie that just knocked everyone out of the out of the park. Everyone was blown away by how well this team movie came about, how, how well it was put together. Like we had Iron Man, then we had the Hulk, then we had Captain America, the first Avenger, and then we had Thor. All four of those films, standalone, were really great and really fun, really well put together films that led up to something I never thought I'd ever see in my adult life, let alone as in my childhood life, an Avengers film with the core Avengers. The, like it's it was a dream come true. And the most satisfying thing about the original Avengers film is just how good it was, how amazing, yeah. amazingly well put together. They made the team, number one, come together through Nick Fury and through Loki. But then the execution of all the different characters that were all introduced in their own standalone films and how all of their characteristics and their flavor all melded together to create this amazing Avengers team. And, and do that fight scene with the Chitauri and all that, which was really satisfying at the end. So how do you beat that? Well, Joss Whedon was like, I, if I'm gonna do the second movie, I'm gonna bring in my fan favorite ult ultimate villain that is his favorite villain was Ultron. So Ultron uh, was born out of the necessity of Tony Stark's feelings about alien, uh, you know, we could just get his like, fears about his the fears. alien invasion. Yeah. He was like, I need some kind of global protection device, and that is ultimately what Ultron became. And with it becoming uh, fusing elements of Stark's personality with Jarvis and all these other characteristics, it actually became became quite a threat. And here we are with Ultron. Everybody's back from the original series, the original uh, uh, Avengers, and then we also had the bonus Vision. So let's talk about your guys. What do you? Th what are your thoughts on Avengers: Age of Ultron? Let's start with you, John. Well, it, it is funny, kind of highlights the fact that 
most of our worst decisions are the decisions we make from a position of fear. And that's what happened with Tony, mm -hmm. right? He's in a position of fear, makes a decision, turns out being a bad decision. I really liked uh, Avengers Age of Ultra. I know there's a lot of people out there who disparage the film. I had a lot of fun. Now, I didn't like the movie as much about a half hour after I watched it, because when I first walked out, I was buzzing. Right. And I thought about it for about a half hour, and it's like, okay, no, I, I didn't like it as much as the first one. I still really like it. And you know what? Every subsequent viewing I've watched of it now still holds up. I still have a lot of fun. I still believe it's not as good as that first Avenger film. Right. I still think the first Avenger film is, all due respect to The Dark Knight, is still my, I think, the best comic book movie we've had yet. But um, it still had... The, all the elements that we love from the first Avengers it had the great one line comedy. We had great camaraderie. Um, James Spader as the voice of Ultron, I thought was so smooth and slick. And one of the things that I like about him, I know some friends of mine wanted Ultron to be more menacing. I like that he was a little bit more suave. He was mm -hmm. a little bit more smooth. And I like that, especially because you had the voice of James Spader there. I like the the additions. I like the ending. Look, did it did it get held up in a few places? Yes. Farmhouse. You and I talk about the farmhouse sure. scene a lot. I still like what they accomplished with the farmhouse scene. Spent too much time there, though, yeah. when there are other things they could have been doing. But I got to tell you, even now, months and months and months after seeing the film, I sit here... And I think I am somebody who's really, I was very satisfied with Avengers Age of Ultron. I, I had a good time with it. Robert, how about you? I feel exactly the same way that you did. I mean, I, I loved the first Avengers like you. I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see an Avengers movie, especially one on such an A-list level. And, and, yeah. and all the characters work. I mean, everybody works. Uh, <coughs> I, I was all about one thing in this movie, and that was the vision. Because I thought there's no way anyone's ever going to put the Vision and Scarlet Witch into a movie, especially from Disney. How are they going to explain their later relationship? Right. Paul Bettany is the Vision. First of all, the character design was unbelievable. It was great. But Paul Bettany is the Vision. You know, goes from Jarvis to becoming Vision. To me, was one of the great joys of the year. I mean, any hope and dream I had of seeing Vision on screen was surpassed. One of my favorite moments. I even kind of teared up. Was, even though it's fast, is when Vision hands Thor his hammer. I mean, if you want to see... one of my all-time funniest moments of any comic book, of almost any movie this uh, year. And, and was it that said moment. so much, too. And, and the, his one-liner, well, I was born yesterday. I mean, there was such wit and intelligence and reverence mm -hmm. in this film. The only, the only, I think, drawback is I would say I loved... First of all, I'm a huge James Spader fan, all the way back to Tough Turf. Um, and Pretty in Pink. But the <laughs> one thing about James Spader was Ultron was Ultron himself really didn't do much. Right. I wanted to see Ultron slaughtering millions of people like he did in Avengers 22. I, he just wasn't that much of a threat. He didn't do anything. I want him to do more. You know, and really, really, he was a, a formidable foe, but it wasn't really until the end when they start fighting all the different Ultrons. I wanted Ultron to, like, take over half the world. Mm -hmm. Take over cities, start rounding people up. You know, but other than that, I, well, like you... I watch this movie all the time. If I've got nothing to do, I'm like, oh, it's always on the top of my stack. Mm. I'll throw it in again and watch it because it's so satisfying. It's so much fun to watch. And if people are saying it's not as good as the first Avengers, well, like you said, that's like the best comic book movie ever. Right. And if this can be an 8.5, if that's a 10, I'm happy we live in a world this exists. I agree. I think, you know, I like to say that The Dark Knight is the best solo superhero film ever made and the avengers is the best team movie ever made that way i don't have to pick but yeah the avengers for me seeing thor fighting the hulk was something that as a little kid all i got was the weird incredible hulk bill bixby lou ferrigno fighting a guy in like a weird fur coat with a thing hey i remember? love that tv movie i hated that tv movie so for me to see the actual real hulk fighting the real thor even for like one minute was amazing um that with that Avengers Age of Ultron, I like you, we saw it and we came back and did our review literally like right after we saw it. So we were really excited. And then a day or two passed and I was like, I might be changing my opinion and changing it a little bit to a little bit less. I still love the film, but for me, I felt the character development of Ultron happened too quick. He just instantly became Ultron. And whereas I wanted to see the, all right, so they've got, uh, you know, Baron Von, uh, what was his name? Strucker. Strucker. They've got that. They're building these. Obviously, they're helping construct an evil Ultron. And then all of a sudden, he's Ultron. All of a sudden, it just happened so fast that Ultron existed and was, you know, fighting Jarvis and take, took, all this stuff just happened in the first 10 minutes. And I, just as a fan of, 
plot development and wanting to care about certain things, I need a little bit more. I need a, one or two more scenes of where did this Ultron come from, then his, him just becoming a character. It just happened so fast for me. That's why some of the payoff towards the end of the, the movie didn't have as much weight. I still love that scene with him and Vision at the very end. That was poignant, and it was really cool. That was a very yeah. that was very different for a comic book movie. To yeah, have that kind of a scene. That yeah, was it was great. it was an elevated scene of a social intelligence. I think where we were dealing with AI. Um, I thought the development of the Vision was great, and it was handled perfectly when you're constructing something that you know is not going to be past three hours. Like like there's limits where they're like, look, you can push it at two twenty, dude, but we need to fill seats. This is a movie. It's about money, and it's like. Make an entertaining, fun film, but you can't have all these side plots and this and that. With that, Joss Whedon did a great job. He fit in and sewed everything so tightly together. I once again feel like I could have like used 10 minutes less of that farm farm scene with Hawkeye. I know they owed Hawkeye a favor because they chumped him and he was a zombie in the first movie. So, <laughs> look, dude, we'll give you a family. You get scenes of you eating breakfast, whatever, Renner, just come back, whatever they had to do. Talk about the extensions you're going to put on your house. Yeah, so, you know, I mean... It was great. I would have wished that was like the uh, special deluxe extended edition of Avengers and the the actual movie that came out had less farmhouse, a little bit more character development of Ultron and a little less of uh, of the fight scene at the end because ultimately whether you're fighting Chitari or Ultron robots or I hope they don't keep doing this like it adds up to nothing. It's just a bunch of things that they're punching and you're like, I'm bored. That's what happened to me when I saw it a second time. I was like, I just I'm bored with the fighting, you know, it's like because it doesn't mean anything because I don't care about the stakes. The stakes aren't elevated enough for me to care yet. And so I think the Marvel films sometimes have that element of like there's too much and there's too many like I'm a robotic figure. If you if you turn off this main switch, we all fall apart, you know, like the hole in the sky. Everybody turns off everybody. You know, it's like it just it doesn't have very that kind phantom of, menace. Yeah, it just I think that that cliche has been used a few too many times. I'm positive that they're not going to do it in civil war or infinity gauntlet i'm i feel very strongly well, fighting each other in civil war yeah so great. i you know avengers age, age of ultron with those uh those uh things that i found that were lacking there were so many things that i loved i absolutely love the vision i love the introduction to scarlet witch even quicksilver though i like the x-men fox's version of quicksilver a lot better than this version of quicksilver i thought the way they introduced this this these the brother and sisters was kind of cool, and I did want more of them. Yes, I wanted to see more of both Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch in this. They it's not that they were given short shrift, but they were interesting, and I liked both the actors. I thought they were great, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that the greatest range of Hot Toys figures ever came from Avengers: Age of Ultron. <laughs> Never have I spent more money on one movie <laughs> figure yeah. ever, and the Hulkbuster's coming out. Right, that's eight hundred dollars oh, yeah. alone. I mean, it's you unbelievable. Guys have, you guys have got like at least four that. grand Check out, out that of Hulkbuster. Uh, four grand out of uh, Robert. Meyer Burnett Unbelievable. With that, yeah. That was a great sequence. The Hulk Hulk Buster fighting Hulk. I think it was in Rio de Janeiro. Where was it? Did, where did that take place? I cannot yeah, remember. Somewhere, somewhere in Brazil. Korea. Yeah, no, yeah, that was so, a different scene. But, yeah, I it mean, was a it was a fantastic fight sequence. It was really fun to see those kinds of those kinds of elements. Like you're like, oh my god, they're gonna spend five minutes of just Hulk fighting uh, the, the Iron Man. This is really pretty cool. And I love the end. They're setting up the new Avengers team that Black Widow and Steve Rogers are now gonna go train our new characters. Right. And, and Vision's one of them, and Scarlet Witch is one of them. And I'm like. All right, bring it on. Bring on phase three. I, yeah. I mean, that was didn't make you want to just... You love all these characters. You just love them all. Yeah, I, especially I, I, of all the scenes that I, I thought were really well put together, I love the sequence on the, on the trucks with Ultron trying to take the Vision's body and Captain America up on top of the on top of the truck. Some of those action oh, sequences, sequence, were, I thought that was awesome. Yeah, incredibly sequence, yeah. well directed. I, I got to say hats off to Joss Whedon for yeah. for being able to handle such an, a, an immense shoot. I got a chance to visit the set while they were shooting a scene that was cut out and now it's available. You can see Thor fighting the Vision. Uh, so we were on set for that sequence, but we also kind of hopped around. We were on the we were on the Quinjet. We were over here. We were over there. We got to interview everybody while they were in costume which was cool or like we're talking to captain america he's right there it was totally weird <laughs> but joss whedon was like beat down limping sweating and you could just tell this was in the middle of the shoot it was an intense like nine month shoot or something this was like a five months in and he was already broken down he's a beaten man but he was not giving up <laughs> and he was giving it his all so you know and what we got was that kind of flavor we got an incredible another amazing avengers film so i'm super happy that that's what we got this year was 
Avengers Age of Ultron. What a what a fun Marvel film. So good. Yeah. Moving on. Let's move on to Fox's Fantastic Four. Even better. This movie came out. Uh, it was directed by Josh Trank. It was written by Simon Kinberg of X-Men fame. It starred Miles Teller, Kate Mara, Jamie Bell, and Michael B. Jordan as the Fantastic Four with Toby Kebbell as the Doctor Doom, the transformed uh, kind of trash can looking Doctor Doom with electric power still, transdimensional Doctor Doom. Um, let's talk about this adaptation. This is now the fourth attempt at making a Fantastic Four movie. If you want to count the if Roger count the Corman, one, yeah. I want to count it because it was an attempt and it's on, but you can watch it on YouTube. It's real. It happened <laughs> and you could see it. Four attempts now. I think four strikes out with the Fantastic Four, unfortunately. There's elements of this film that I liked a lot, just like there's elements that I liked even in the Fantastic Four Corman film. Also elements in, I wouldn't say the first the first Fantastic Four Fox film, but the Rise of the Silver Surfer. I liked the way some of the Silver Surfer was portrayed. I liked the actor who pl played uh, uh, the Silver Surfer, Jones, uh, What's his name again? Doug? Doug, Doug Jones. Jones. Thank you so much, Doug Jones. He's a great performance actor as well as just an actor in the himself. He was voiceovered and by... a funny guy. Yeah, he got his voice replaced by, ne Morpheus. Uh, by Morpheus. So that, that, they didn't need to do that. But anyway, what are your thoughts? Let's start with you, John. Robert. It was so disappointing. You know, I, I, I didn't like this movie, honestly, from the casting. I've always thought, even as a kid, Reed Richards is like my dad. He's an older dude. Like he's, I always thought he was in maybe his late thirties, early forties. You know, you know, why don't they keep to that? I'm watching these these people in the movie. I just don't buy them. First of all, as as the characters, right. I didn't I didn't like them. So I don't. I, they're all fine performers. I mean, look at Creed. That was kind of a superhero movie this right. year too that I loved. But it just didn't gel. It it felt wrong from the get go. Even like I know you were looking for that Fantastic Four flavor with the Mole Man and at the very beginning of the run of the comic. I want to see the Kirby, you know, run or or even John Byrne's Cosmic run mm -hmm. from Fantastic. Four. They don't. They can't do that. They don't really know how to do it. it uh, it's elusive. I don't know why. But they can't. They can't nail that formula. How about you, John? I was. Well, first, I went through three stages of my fandom when it came to uh, Fantastic Four. The first was the initial stage. I didn't want the Fantastic Four babies. You guys heard me talk about that for about a year. I wanted Reed Richards, who was my dad. I, right. There's this, there's this illusion in Hollywood right now that for a comic book movie to work or superheroes to work, they have to be high schoolers because a lot of young people, which is true, a lot of young people like to go to these comic book movies, but the assumption is unless, unless they're supposed to be high schoolers, whatever, young people won't attach them. Bull. Bull. You know what their favorite guy is right now? Tony Stark. And he's like 50. And they, what, what, like give younger viewers more credit. They just want great characters. That's what they want. Hey, if they happen to be young, that's great too. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Right. So I didn't like it. Now, I got over my, my disappointment that they went with a young, young cast when I realized, hey, look, you have four stupidly talented performers here mm -hmm. with Michael B. Jordan, Miles Teller, like Kate Mar. Like, this was a really talented cast. I love what Josh Trank did on Chronicle. Uh, Simon Kimberg, his work speaks for itself. So I got over it. And I was like, you know what? I think there's a lot of reason to look forward to this movie. And I'm going to say this Fantastic Four is not the biggest pile of trash of the year. The first act actually is not bad the, the the setup for the movie is actually really not that bad i'll give you that yeah i, I agree with the you. the first act kind of worked as a matter of fact it went downhill pretty fast but you know it, it was it was okay up to a point this was a great example of a bad situation between a director who made some poor decisions a studio that made some radically poor decisions and poor actions and it never being able to recover and never truly having a vision for the movie when everything got started. The director did, but the studio wants something different and it just never worked out. And what you saw was what, not the worst film of the year, but truly was a mess. The movie's a mess. I could call it, uh, because what excited me about uh, the film after I saw the first trailer and, and read some of the comments that Josh Trank was talking about with like some some uh, scanners and the fly and this and that, what I would call this movie is a Brundle fly. 
It is yeah, basically yeah. a weird <laughs> really hybrid of, of many great ideas, but then with so much studio interference and, and you can actually feel when the movie changes, when it becomes, when it's taken out of someone's hands and put into the negative zone or whatever you want to call it, just like floaty zone of indecision and here, what about this? Let's try that. What about this? Try this now. It just, you're watching a series of bad decisions and a series of scenes that don't connect anymore until you get to the credits and you're like, what the f did I just see? What trash just transpired when I was in it? You know, I'll say this about the first 35 minutes. I loved it and I was even willing to accept that these people are not in high school. Like they're, sure. they have all these kids with science experiments who look like they're 12. And then you have Miles Teller, who's obviously, a, <laughs> obviously a man. He's a man. He's not a boy. He's not in high school. He's not even in college, yo. He's a grown ass man. Okay. So sorry. So is Michael B. Jordan. He's not 18. He's in his twenties. He's a grown ass man. So with that, I was like, look, I'm with you. They're these super talented kids. They got moved over to this weird government experiment. Let's see what happens. The minute that they went to the negative zone or the planet zero, whatever they called it, they lost me. They yeah. lost me because Invisible Girl got her powers just by being near it. She should have gone with them. There's decisions that didn't make sense. And I know that they were trying to youngify it or whatever. They ultimates it up because, because as a person we're going to talk about, coming right up Peyton Reed Peyton Reed had the Fantastic Four and he was developing that as a film from the 60s perspective it was going to be all Stanley and Jack Kirby and good god do I want to see that do I want to see at least the production design drawings at least what they were trying to do what they were going to do with that film especially now seeing what a comic book sweaty like Peyton Reed did with Ant-Man I mean it's fantastic what he did with that property even after all the pain and sorrow of hearing about Edgar Wright and what happened with him and you know we ended up getting what an amazing film which we're going to talk about Ant-Man in a second but Fantastic Four is such an ultimate disappointment to me because that was my f gateway drug to comic books as a little kid I was into Godzilla and Gamera and King Kong and anything that had anything to do with Ray Harryhausen and monsters I loved monsters and dinosaurs and my dad got me a, a Fantastic Four comic because it was monsters. It was monsters fighting monsters. And that's what I was my gateway drug into. Wow, here's a monster. It's called Spider-Man. It's a guy who's half monster. He's a spider. It's every single Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko. What differentiates myself in my mind from me, DC and Marvel is DC is all about the gods the Greek gods and Marvel is all about the mutants and the monsters. And I think that's why people can identify a little bit more with the, the I was a man, I got transformed into a monster. It's like you can identify with the trials and tribulations and they're all real people and they all live in real cities and they have real people problems. They, none of the Fantastic Four really got along. Human Torch was always fighting with the things, certain things like that, that I wish I saw a little bit more of in this film. And I wish, these are the wish fulfillments where you you see something that's going to come out and then you're hoping with whatever your thoughts are from what you loved about that property that they're going to bring that with them. And most of the time with every single Fantastic Four film, they have not. Even when you have what some would call like a really uh, straightforward adaptation, which was the Roger Corman version, the, the you know, the one that cost five dollars. They did the strictest adaptation of the comic book, the 1960, yeah. I think it's 63, 1963 comic book. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 63, but you know, it was like they did that origin. They get, they go up in a spaceship. They get hit with gamma rays. They crash land. They have the weird, hey, look, I'm stretchy. I'm on fire. I'm rocks. You know, I'm invisible. Then they, you know, they got gathered up by. It was a by the book adaptation of that Stanley Jack Kirby comic book. Though it was really cheap, it also just didn't really work. I know they didn't have the Mole Man. They had the guy. I'm the Gem Encruster or whatever his name was. <laughs> the they had Doctor Doom. A lot of it just fell apart towards the end. They did do the origin as faithful as possible. But we live in this world now where you can really do something that's a hybrid. You don't have to go back to 1963. You can do a Fantastic Four movie now but still stay as faithful to the Stanley Jack Kirby super cosmic adventure. I think it's still possible. 
I'd like to see it happen. It hasn't happened yet. There's elements, like I said, of all of these Fantastic Four films that work. Unfortunately, a lot of, of elements in this film just fell apart. I mean, did I like the sequence with Doom walking and exploding heads? It looked cool, but is that Doctor Doom? Not really. And then what happened to Doctor Doom? He's like, why is he coming back? Where did he get the cape? What's his, what's his, if he's having so much fun on Planet Zero, why do you have to come back and try to destroy Earth? None of it really made sense. No, you know, John, I, what I don't understand is we got a Fantastic Four movie. The Incredibles. Mm. The Incredibles is the Fantastic yes. Four for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful film, even though it's animated and it 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 has a Doctor Doom esque villain and syndrome, and it it makes sense. It feels because the Fantastic Four is a is a family story right. as well as it is. I mean, sure, Ben Grimm is not part of the family, but it's it's a married couple. They're younger. I mean, for all intents and purposes, Johnny Storm is is their son. Right. Like you know, I mean, Franklin Richards comes along later, but. It, it, it is like that, and they never have nailed that dynamic. They haven't even approached it from that angle. And The Incredibles certainly does a wonderful job of that. Why don't you go and look to The Incredibles and, and then try and look back at the old comics? Well, the I 60s. think it's like, especially with this version of the Fantastic Four, if, if it felt to me like, hey, we they already tried it with this, then they tried it with that. We got to go with this Ultimates version. And just things fell apart. So it was like nothing was ever secure, and things were just never allowed to grow so i mean that's what we got was like kind of a a weird stillborn creature that you know i'm out here i am people are like what is this you well know? another thing that they i don't think they trusted josh trank for whatever reason if you look at the marvel movies what kevin feige is doing he's making interesting choices mm -hmm. as far as getting the russo brothers in the first place they've yes. done one feature right they've done a lot of television they bring them on board and they knock it out of the park peyton reed again you bring somebody on that hadn't worked in the marvel universe before and they allow those guys to do there's a lot of really interesting and fun directorial flourishes in our next film mm -hmm. and there's like none of that all of that's been bled away from Fantastic Four and you should trust I mean knowing what Brian Singer does right. for the X-Men it's too bad they didn't allow their director look at how well reason. directed Chronicle is and look at how this movie feels like it's shackled absolutely but it brings up the two there's some people like to cry about studio interference and the fact of the matter is studio is the ones in charge of the movie but there are two types of studio interference you want to talk about studio interference? You know what studio interferes the most? Marvel. Kevin Feige, make no mistake, is the man in charge of every single... Nothing happens in any Marvel movie that he does not have direct okay mm -hmm. power over. But here's the difference between what Kevin Feige does with Marvel and what Fox at least did in the situation of Fantastic Four. Kevin Feige will sit down with a film... Josh, uh, uh, Josh uh, Whedon tells this great story about the first Avengers movie. You think Joss Whedon just had full control? No, 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 no. There's all these different things he wanted to do with the movie that Kevin Feige said, nope, nope, nope. Right. Yes, you can do that. Do this instead. Like, he wanted Wasp in the first one. Nope, we're going to have Black, uh, Black Panther. We're going to have Black Widow. and it, All that kind of stuff. But here's the difference. Kevin Feige goes through all of that stuff with his filmmakers before the cameras start to roll. Mm -hmm. They hammer out all the major points, all the direction they want to go, and where the film has to end up. Then he lets the director go direct that movie the way we just planned out, and you direct it with your flavor, go. What happened with Fantastic Four is the wrong kind of studio interference, which is... Hey, we're going to make a movie together. Okay, great. It's like, Schnepp is going to direct, and I'm producing it. I've got this movie I want to make. All right, Schnepp, we're going to make a movie Here's about this. Yeah, about this thing yeah. here. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, go make that movie. So these scenes, these are the five action scenes I've got. Great, we're go good? for okay, it. Okay, let's make Now, that. he goes and starts making his movie, and then I wander, waddle down to set one day. Hey, Schnepp, I don't like the way you're doing that. Well, what? But we agreed on the, these five action scenes are going to happen. I don't understand. What do you, what do you mean? Tell you what. what here, here's 50 bucks. Why don't you go grab lunch? Okay. Now, while he's gone, I'm going to bring in Robert. Robert, you now come in and direct this. All right. That's what happened. <laughs> right. That's the two different types. There is good studio interference. That's the control that Kevin Feige has at Marvel. And then there's bad studio interference, which was they had no idea what they were doing from the get-go. Midway through the process, they start to meddle in what the director already got their okay on to right. do. And it's just, it became a mess. Well, yeah, that, there's a really fun uh, and horrible thing that happens, and it happens, uh, we cr we call it frame effing, is basically what happens in the edit room when people start, like, producers and people who, like, want to have to feel like they have to say something in the room. They're like, well, can, can you just go forward, like, five frames? You mean these five frames where the where it stops? 
Like, like, <laughs> what do you what do you think I'm doing? I've looked at every single shot before you ever came in the room. This is the best edited scene that you're gonna have, but have at it. Let's watch all the footage again, you know, just so that you feel confident. So it's a thing that how I came up as an editor, you start to learn how to do like you edit and how you have to deal with different personalities with something like this. Unfortunately, this was like those five action scenes were all pulled away. You can have one action scene after you're filming. And then after the film's over, they're like, how come it doesn't have any action? You're like, well, dude, because you pulled all these action scenes. Ah, uh, well, we're gonna have someone else film a new version of these action scenes and that don't make any sense with what you've already made. Yeah. So you ultimately, all of a sudden, you start to have a weird creature that's being hacksawed and built together a Frankenstein monster. And that happens on so many productions, it's sickening. What That happens all the time. And one of the things that's great about Kevin Feige is yes, they get they they approve the script they make the thing they change things and then they give a couple months later to reshoot stuff and remake things and like let's cut that out and redo this they have it budgeted for reshoots and pickups and it's basically just to make the film better so it's like oh that didn't work or this needs that extra scene we need a close-up of this that's the way you make a film you know it's a team effort peter jackson you know pioneered that with the lord of the rings movies they were very iterative and he, yeah. would, he would have 60 days of pickup shots mm. on, on those films. But I think Kevin Feige learned where, ironically, making superhero movies at Fox, working on Daredevil, working on X-Men, and, mm. and watching what goes right and what goes wrong. And I really think that the the, the batting average that Marvel has now at, at, at Disney is pretty phenomenal. Probably the best run studio, uh, best run of studio successful movies ever. I mean, if you just look at Marvel Studios, they haven't had a movie that didn't work it's kind of ridiculous like uh, you look at phase one and phase two you're like i sometimes i can't even as a sweaty i'm like i can't believe we've got all of these movies just from this one studio it's like a yeah. weird solid brick of films you're like that's crazy and you go back and you know you watch captain america the first avenger it's dellightful like you watch I it again. really like you the go, first yeah, Captain America. And that's yeah. Joe Johnson. He directed yep. the, the rocketeer, rocketeer and then what else they were like they they've given a lot it's like the rocketeer is one of the one of the great unsung. It comic certainly book is. Movies. It's a it's a great comic book movie. Based but what I'm Dave saying Steven's is like, there's book. like, yeah, we've got the Russos and we've got Joss Whedon, but they've picked a lot of different people to like a lot of talented directors to work on stuff. Speaking of, let's move on to our last film of 2015, our last superhero film, Ant Man. Now Peyton Reed, he directed it. It's based on a script by Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish and Adam McKay and Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd plays the title character of Ant Man. His uh, his uh. Uh, the original Ant-Man is played by Michael Douglas. You've got Evangeline Lilly in there. You've got Corey Stoll as the villain. And you've got the scene-stealing Michael Pena as uh, one of the, the you know, of uh, Ant-Man's uh, gang of uh, thieves. Let's talk about Ant-Man. John, let's start off with you. Let's talk about what a delight Ant-Man was. Such a great way to end the year in comic book movies. I, I, I mean, Ant-Man, well, at least, I can't, now I can't remember. What came What came last, Ant-Man or Fantastic Four? Fantastic Four came last, but okay. we wanted to end yeah, it like, talking yeah, about Ant-Man. Yeah, ending on with the discussion. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely the right word. It's delightful. It's fun. And you just, you love these characters. I love the way they set up that, you know, you had Michael uh, Douglas, you know, as the original Ant-Man, which he was, mm -hmm. passing it on to Paul Rudd. You know, and there's a lot of talk. I remember when it came down, their news came out that, hey, it looks like it's come down to Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Paul Rudd. Now, eight out of ten movies, and you say you can have Paul Rudd or Joseph Gordon-Levitt, eight out of ten, I might gravitate towards Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Phenomenal talent. But I felt really good about Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. I know some people, and you know, especially when you consider all the drama that surrounded this movie with Edgar Wright coming and leaving, I always thought that it was the right decision, both for Edgar Wright and for Marvel to move, move on. Edgar Wright had a great idea for an Ant-Man film, but that idea was formulated before the Marvel Cinematic Universe existed. Marvel had to make the decision that was best for their universe, that they were very careful to, to uh, uh, cultivate and make the way that it is. And I think it worked out best for everybody. Peyton Reed comes in. I think he just crushed it. Who would have thought you could do a movie called Ant-Man? It sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It is ridiculous on many levels. But Evangeline Lilly was small, was, was uh, slick, I mean. Uh, Michael Douglas was great, and Paul Rudd was great. But you ain't kidding when you say the scene-stealing Michael Pena. Because, dear, I mean, I sat down with Michael Pena, and I said to him, dude, first 30 seconds, your guy's on screen. 
I thought you were going to annoy me the whole movie. Mm -hmm. And you made that movie for me. He was so delightful. And the way him and Paul Rudd play off each other. Great, great chemistry. Right from that first conversation with them in the van together. Yeah, and they deported my dad. But I got the van. I mean, just the way they played <laughs> off each other was so great. I could have just sat and watched the two of them talking over pancakes for like an hour. I, I like the little Sazic. Back it up. Keep no, no, no. Keep backing yeah. up. Back up. Back, no, no. Keep yeah. backing yeah, up. Yeah, we're gonna keep, help a friend, and nothing's yeah. gonna stop us. We're backing up. We're just we're backing up. Yeah. We're backing up. That like, was so good. A thing too about that film that the way it begins, it begins with just a bunch of Marvel fan service backstory. Let's, it begins, it begins at the under construction shield Triskelion, mm -hmm. where, Which uh, where, was great. where a right. CGI young Michael Douglas comes in. I mean, they right. CG his face, uh, comes in and talks to Howard Stark, you know, right. and agent Carter's there. I mean, it's so great. And there's been no Marvel logo yet. You know, it just starts 1988. Right. And then when that scene's over, when he storms out of the room, it cuts to this like, you know, almost like a pina colada song as the marvel logo finally comes up and you're like okay you know immediately that all right we're in the marvel universe we see people we know new character we, we, all good and then boom with this choice of music it's not you're in a different movie altogether mm -hmm. and then it starts with paul rudd getting his face beat in and you think he's going to get destroyed and then it becomes a ritual they're saying goodbye to him there's a big which hug. told you so much, so much about his character right. without having to have 10 minutes of dialogue right, you learn right. so much about his character from just his interaction with his son and you're learning it as you go you don't need it his origin story was beautifully done because it's character you're establishing his character after the fact you don't right. you need you know he's a burglar because he's been in jail you know mm -hmm. that judy greer plays his ex-wife and and uh uh, Bobby Cannavale plays uh, his the, the the new rival for his daughter's affection. Who was great, yeah. by the Who way. Was visual, yeah. visual exposition is what you're talking about, which yes. is the greatest kind of cinematic master. That's a, that's what cinema is made for. Absolutely, cinematic it, exposition. It was, Don't have a scene of three people sitting in a, a, a semicircle explaining things. Show what they're talking about. And they did a brilliant job when someone does explain something. When Michael Pena's like, "Well, how did you? Let me tell you how I found out about this." Oh kid. yeah, that was talk about a directorial flourish. I don't know if that was scripted when he's telling the story and you got to see all the different people talking in, in his voice. voice. So and they do it twice. It was so well done, <laughs> yeah. and it was so much fun to watch because it was almost like the Marvel version of a screwball comedy in mm -hmm. a way, with an action scene at the end of the movie that takes place in a little girl's bedroom. Mm hmm. Yeah, one of the one of the greatest set pieces that they've ever done, and it's I especially had so much fun with the they're on, and then it goes back to the little tiny, like the sound oh, design, yeah. and like you really are playing with size. I mean, someone watched Ardman Animations, the wrong trousers. You know, right. somebody must right. must have got that idea, but it's so well done. It's so good. I loved it so much. And guys, never forget, Baskin Robbins always finds out. That's right. There's a lot. There's so much fun and humor in this. That's I, the best product placement, by the way, probably in any movie ever. <laughs> I feel I feel the the ghost of Edgar Wright in so many of these little flourishes, like what well, you're talking about. He's still listed about. as a screenwriter and That's as, what I'm as saying. a producer. I, I and... think that he's on, He's a lot of his elements of him are still in there. I don't know which what, is or what compare. Like maybe Michael Pena's when he's talking and then it goes into the oh, different Mark, voices. Knowing Ardman Animation, knowing the wrong trout, knowing yeah, Wallace and Gromit had to have come Elements from of it that feel the, the the presence of Edgar is there, but once again, there's also a lot of really unique uh, uh, scenarios in this film that I hadn't seen yet, like the miniature tank, and just like some of the ways they played with the idea of miniaturization. Uh, I can't wait to see what they keep doing with Ant-Man. I thought Paul Rudd did a fantastic job uh, riding that line of being funny yet still real. Like I'm not, I'm not doing a bit. I'm not, I'm not in a comedy movie. He, he felt like a real character who just was sincerely funny and hung out with dudes who like to like crack jokes all the time. It didn't feel like, now nah, here's our funny guys. It was just like, oh no, that's how they talk. Well, it was all organic. The yeah. tone again was, they nailed the tone. I mean, Peyton Reed nailed that tone. And again, very different from any other Marvel movie. The yeah, feeling of different. it, it's legitimately a, a lighthearted comedy caper film, which is so what much they fun. tried And to you do. know what's funny? You, I love what you just said. It's a very different Marvel film. Aside from Age of Ultron, the last three Marvel films have been very different. What you're talking about, Ant-Man, very different kind of comic book movie. 
Guardians of the Galaxy mm -hmm. was a very unique kind of comic movie. Captain America Winter Soldier was totally 70s thriller right. kind of thing. I mean, they have been doing such a great job mixing it up, never making it feel tired or formulaic, and, and yet you come to Ant-Man and they just still remind you we're still Marvel, we're still fun, you're going to have a good time, and they just crush it. I them. absolutely loved that scene where they, and here's the thing, like, with Marvel movies, you have this thing where you have the Hulk, and then he has to fight another kind of Hulk, the Abomination. You have Iron Man, and then he has to fight another kind of an Iron Man, whether it's Iron Monger or a dude like the, you know, what's his name? Whiplash. Whiplash. Michael, uh, Michael is gay. He still ended up putting on other armor. So um, with this, look, we knew that he was going to be fighting another Ant-Man called Yellow Jacket, but the way that they did it was so unique and entertaining them fighting in that suitcase sense. with the cure song <laughs> has yeah. got to be my highlight of any of the scenes <laughs> of any action scene any superhero scene that i saw all year because it was so fun and different and then just a cutaway to seeing that suitcase falling and then cutting back in <laughs> i mean it's just so much fun and then to the train set sequence so much of it was so unique and fun and different and like you said so i, I said earlier it's a, a delight where at when it ended uh, Holly and I both had such smiles on our yeah. faces. We were like, because you go in there and we're big Edgar Wright fans. We love everything he's ever done, including everything from space, all of his work. So coming into this film with like a little bit of dread and apprehension, even though we'd seen the trailers and we're like, it looks fun. What's this film going to be like? That it that it was such a fun and entertaining film and satisfying. We felt good about, we didn't feel that good about the way things worked for Edgar. We're looking forward to his next film, super talented guy, but the way Ant-Man turned out was, I've always loved Ant-Man as a kid. I wrote a comic book with one of my best friends who illustrated it. That never happened because we're 18, we're in college, but I've always loved Ant-Man and the, the idea behind Ant-Man. I thought it was a really weird and unique character I never thought I'd see a movie version of this weird character, and they did it. Now we're seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp. They've already got a sequel going because so many of you people love the movie. It yeah. was such a great hit. And Evangeline, Evangeline Lilly was amazing. I mean, she was tough. She was rough and tumble. Oh, yeah. She didn't take any shit from anybody. She was great. She's a great actress. Since Lost, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've loved seeing her act, and she was great in the Hobbit movies, but uh, you know, I'm not a big... She was really good, too, in that uh, Hugh Jackman real steal. The, oh, the right. robot boxing yep. movie. She was actually, I, I didn't even know she was in it when I went in to watch the mm -hmm. film for the first time. It's like she came and she, it's not a huge role, but she added a lot of human depth to it that Definitely. the movie needed. And she's always been impressive. Yeah, she was great as, as uh, Janet. So I thought I can't wait to see her get more screen time in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that are complaining, a lot of the more erudite film pundits that, oh, superhero movies are taking over the multiplex. Mm -hmm. and what's it doing to cinema? Right. And I would say, you know what? If there's going to be movies like Captain America Winter Soldier that even Jeffrey Wells, if you ever read Hollywood Elsewhere, even he liked, and you can make Winter Soldier and Ant-Man and, as you said, Guardians of the Galaxy, just because those three movies come from Marvel Studios and are based on comic book properties, they're as different as movies can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're dealing with Look at what Ant-Man's about. It's about a guy who really just wants to get back together with his family. Right. He wants to be a father to his daughter. I mean, yet it's a superhero caper movie. And the older father wants to be a father to his daughter. It's, uh, it's two uh, father yeah, and daughter. Absolutely. And that's that's really theme. That if anybody wants to know what makes a comic book movie work, it's those kinds of character dynamics. Because at their core, when you strip away all of the comic book accoutrements, the, the fantastical elements, the crazy costumes, the army of actual ants... You know, you take away all that, and it is about fathers and daughters. And that could be, if they made a Sundance drama mm -hmm. that cost a million dollars, it could be about the exact same thing. This is just wrapped up in a big bow of well, fun. I'm glad you brought that up, because that, that you know, we're, we're ending this, we're doing a little summation of the four big superhero films that came out this year. And I've heard that left and right from lots of people complaining about oh, this, you know, glut of superhero films, and it's ruining this, and it's ruining that. And it's like, Honestly, when I look at it, I look at it, this is just an evolution of technology and it's evolution of the way our culture is. So yeah, you know, 20 years ago, we weren't seeing a lot of superhero films. We, you know, that, that hadn't come into flow yet. There were a lot of other films that were like making a lot of money here and there. But we live in a world now where we have so many different things. People are on their phone constantly. They can watch Netflix on their phone. You've got Netflix, you've got Hulu and Amazon and all these other uh, streaming services which have 
it created an, a binge watching marathon style. Like I want to have 13 episodes of this. And now we're getting that with not only superhero films, we're getting that with all kinds of series and dramas and thrillers and things that used to be an independent film are now going to be on Amazon as a 13 episode thing. And you're able to not just see an hour and a half series like Transparent as a movie, but you get to see it as a 13 episode story arc. Well, also no one complained like about in the 70s, there's a glut of cop films. Nobody said that Serpico and the French <laughs> Connection and Prince of the no City. No one did, no. No one ever said, well, God, I'm tired of cop movies because they dealt with the dark underbelly of civilization and people- How I many think, movies are gonna have about solving a murder? Absolutely, oh. oh my God, or lawyer films or something. Whereas, you know, why should, why should these films be penalized because they're essentially flights of fancy when they're still really about characters and people? The Avengers are as much family movies anything else a dysfunctional family but it's still about real people albeit in fantastical mm. situations and what what why is that any less valid than I watching guess, something that's set in the real world it, it's not i guess what i was trying to say is like that the that there's different levels now and that well, cinema I think you're absolutely right though is giant event style films and the people who are complaining about these event style films aren't realizing that our watching culture has changed and all the independent films that there is no market for anymore really are now all moving smartly so to the television world or the cable world or the internet world because that's the perfect home for that kind of delivery system of story of entertainment of media and so there's nothing to complain about i feel like people who are complaining like that i feel a little bit are stuck in the past and aren't really accepting the world that we live in right now so it's sort of the sooner you get over the weird complaining problems that you have about something that's not even real anymore the sooner you can move on and be creative in your own world and realize that, the, that it's all happening in a good way the, the thing what they what people got to realize is this because I, it drives me nuts when i hear anybody it doesn't matter if they're in the industry or out saying oh the, all these comic book movies are ruining moving on really something that is getting people to come back to the movie theater mm -hmm. in record numbers by the way that's ruining. They remind me of a lot of the same people who complain about Justin Bieber. Oh, Justin Bieber sucks. You know what? There's a lot of people out there that love listening to his music. And now you got a new generation of people that are becoming music buyers for the music industry. And it may not be for you, and it's certainly not for me. But when you're sitting there saying, you know what's happening in the movie industry? The audiences are voting with their dollars. They're going to the movie theaters and they're buying tickets. By extension, what you're saying when you say comic book movies are ruining movies, what you're saying is you think the audience is stupid and you know better than they do. And I, I just say get over yourself. This is what the trend is right now. Trends come and go. We talk about you All and I talk time. about this time. Trends will come and go. Superhero movies will not always be the big movies. Cop movies, murder mysteries, what it, romantic comedies will not always be the big movies. Everything will ebb and flow. But as one movie executive told us, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, one of the movies that's one of my favorites of the year is Spotlight. You know, movies like Spotlight, I'm not specifically talking about Spotlight, I'm just using an example, get made because the studios are making tons of money, they can finance some of these other projects that yes. never could have gotten financed otherwise. So it's an era, it will come, it will go, it will always be around in some form, but ultimately it's about not what are the studios pushing on us, it's the studios reacting to what the audience is voting for with their dollars. And right now, that is comic book movies, so just suck it up. We're also getting them, and they're beautifully made. You know, if you they're wanna, getting better and better. And if you want to go to the movies and have a great time, like here's what I don't, I find interesting about our own sweaty uh, a group of people, all the people that watch this show. We're always so quick now to damn movies before we've seen them. Quicksilver right. and Days of Future Past. Ugh, it's terrible. Yeah. Then you see them and you love them. These filmmakers now, for the most part, are very smart and savvy. That's why I wouldn't write off Batman v Superman because oh, Doomsday doesn't look right. Right. I think that these filmmakers, they know, man, we're, we're in a golden era of fantasy filmmaking. Yep. That for the most part, if, if, if these directors and these voices are allowed to, to bubble up, which they are because they're making a lot of money, they're putting out some, who would have thought Days of Future Past would have been as good as it was? Nope. Who would have thought the first Avengers movie would have worked? Who would have thought they would have made an Iron Man, Thor, and a Captain America movie first? That all three would work. I mean, it's amazing the time we live in, and I would give filmmakers now the benefit of the doubt because we're getting we're getting a, a we're getting riches beyond what we've ever imagined. Even the Force Awakens, mm -hmm. which we already had to go through the prequels, look at that. Even that film has delighted audiences and it's become the biggest film of all time. The opening, and rightfully so. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this: I think Except we've got Star Trek. We've got well, yeah, <laughs> we've got a great year of 2016 coming Ahead of to us. us. Cannot wait. 
it's exciting. We had this year, we had four amazing superhero films. One, not as great as we wanted. Three fantastic ones. We're going to rank them? Uh, yeah, let's rank them. Let's start off with, uh, let's start off with, um, uh, Kingsman. Let's, uh, from one to 10, what's your, uh, what's your score, Robert? I'd give it an eight. Point five. Okay. John? I haven't thought about a score for each. I just thought about a rank for each myself. So I can tell you how I would order these. Oh, uh, you this mean like year. from one to four? Yeah, from one to four. Sure, let's do that. So um, how about you? Like one to four, rank them. You know, honestly, in terms of sheer enjoyment, I'm going to put Ant-Man at the top. Mm -hmm. Very close. It, I have to say all three, Avengers, Kingsman, and Ant-Man are very close for me. Kingsman are different. There's different kinds of, but I would say that I would go Ant Man first, maybe a, a quarter point behind. I'd put Kingsman mm -hmm. and a quarter, quarter. So if Ant Man is 9.5 or 9 for me, mm -hmm. Kingsman is 8.75, mm -hmm. and Avengers Age of Ultron is 8.50. Right on. Yeah, I, I'm very, very, a little bit in a different order, but very similar to you. The top three are, it reminds me a lot of last year. Last year we had four major comic book movies, if you don't count um, Big Hero 6, right. as an end, which was delightful, by the oh, way. Uh, and so you had three great ones, X-Men Days of Future Past, Guardians of the Galaxy, Captain America Winter Soldier, and then you had Spider, The Amazing Spider-Man Spider 2. Yeah. That's kind of a lot like this year. We have the Fantastic Four going to come up last for me. Uh, third... But it's one one A and one B. It's crazy. In third, uh, I'm going to put Kingsman: The Secret Service. In second, just barely, I'm going to put Ant Man. And uh, number one for me will be Avengers: Age of Ultron. But those top three are so close to each other for me. Yeah, for me, as far as my my favorites, the my favorite superhero film of the year, Ant Man. It was hands down most enjoyable, most fun that I've had at the film, at any theater, in any film, in any superhero film, hadn't laughed and enjoyed myself as much. An unexpected uh, variation of the superhero film. It was really, really entertaining. Second for me was Kingsman. Once again, also a really fun spy film, uh, really original. Matthew Vaughn continues to amaze me. Uh, number three, just a little bit under Kingsman, Avengers Age of Ultron. It got the vision right. It had so many amazing sequences in it. It was a really fun, another fun Avengers film. And last was Fantastic Four. Obviously, it had a lot of problems. Didn't work out the way any of us wanted it to work out. So you had four amazing films. Three of them just really all like knocking it out of the park. Really entertaining, really fun superhero films. Next year, we've easily got eight. You know, you've got Deadpool, you've got Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, you have Captain America Civil War, you have Doctor Strange, you have X-Men Apocalypse, Suicide Squad, Suicide Squad, and a lot of other films. So we're going to be covering all those on Collider Heroes next year. I want all of you guys to have a great holiday season. Have a great new year. I'll see y'all in 2016, and we're going to sign off with Robert Meyer Burnett. Where can people find you online? People can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett or check into my project Axonar at SaveTheFederation.com. And John Campia, where can people find you? You can find me all over Collider Movie Talk and Collider Movie News, but also just follow me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. Hey, once again, you've been watching the special Collider Heroes 2015 wrap up. I'm John Schnepp. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened at TDOSLWH.com. You can get a digital download or rent it for a friend for the holiday seasons. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next year. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.